Greetings, good afternoon, and welcome to our talk today. I am Carrie Cordova, an associate professor in the Department of American Studies and the associate director of the Center of Mexican American Studies. I am also serving as a co-chair of the search uh, for a new director with the Center of Mexican American Studies with my colleague, Dr. Nestor Rodriguez, a professor in the Department of Sociology. This is a special moment for the center as it celebrates its 50th anniversary and also looks to the future. The next director will have a significant role in shaping Latino studies at the University of Texas at Austin. The duties of the director include, but are not limited to, planning and implementing original public programming, alumni relations, community outreach, and development efforts, building community among faculty, staff, and students, and coordinating with senior university leadership and collaborating with other units on campus. The director will officially assume office on September 1st, 2021, and hold a four-year term. As a co-chair of this search, we are gathering public feedback and sharing this information with our Latino Studies leadership and the Dean of the uh, College of Liberal Arts. Everyone registered for this talk today will receive a request for feedback at the end of our talk. We invite you to attend both talks and to share with us your thoughts on the candidates and on the direction of the Center of Mexican American Studies that you would like to see. We also will make recordings of the talk available for those unable to attend, and those recordings will be accompanied with requests for further feedback. I believe those will be available this Wednesday. In presenting these candidates, I can offer that both of these candidates are outstanding faculty with enormous accomplishments. I have the great pleasure today of introducing Dr. Laura Gutierrez. Laura Gutierrez is an associate professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latino Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin, where she has served as interim chair and is now serving as associate chair. She teaches classes related to culture and performance from a queer and feminist position and across the curriculum, often using a transnational framework. She also advises a number of graduate students with research and artistic interests related to those areas. Gutierrez holds affiliate appointments in the Center for Mexican American Studies, the Center for Women's and Gender Studies, the LGBTQ Studies Program, the Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies, and the Latino Media Arts Studies Program. She is the author of Performing Mexicanidad, Vendidas y Cabareteras on the Transnational Stage, and has published essays and book chapters on topics such as Latinx performance, border art, Mexican video art, and Mexican political cabaret. Some recent writing has appeared in book chapter form in Decentering the Nation and the Cambridge History of Latino Latino Literature. She also has published short essays in recent exhibition catalogs. She is currently completing a monograph tentatively titled Binding Intimacies in Contemporary Queer, Latinx Performance and Visual Art that opens up the possibility to think about the notion of intimacy, to conceptualize collaborations and conversations related to artistic work, including the life the artists live and strive to make more livable, even under great duress. Um, because of her deep commitment to contemporary art and culture makers that exist on the margins, Gutierrez is on the board of and part of the curating team of Outsider Fest, an Austin-based queer transmedia nonprofit. And on occasion, she collaborates with artists. And lastly, she is also on the board of Tepoztlan Institute for the Transnational History of the Americas, which meets in Mexico once a year for a week-long seminar that's structured around the sharing and discussion of ideas and work in progress. 
Uh, she's also a fantastic colleague, and I am delighted to welcome her to this stage, such as it is. Thank you for joining us. We will also be asking for your questions, and um, there is a, a question and answer session shortly after Dr. Gutierrez gives her talk, and from there, I will turn the stage over to her. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to share um, my screen so that you can see a PowerPoint with just some um, images that I have there, um, mostly text in terms of like wanting to give you a sense of what I'm going to be talking about today. And just in the interest of ensuring that um, I sort of keep to time, I'm going to read um, uh, what is in front of me. So I want to begin by offering a set of thank yous. First of all, to the co-chairs of this search committee, Kerry Cordova and Nestor Rodriguez, for your invitation to give this presentation and more than anything, for your labor in working together along with the EC the Latino Studies Leadership and the College of Liberal Arts to select the new CMAS director. I'm honored to stand before all of you in your quest in identifying a good person to lead CMAS for the next few years. I also want to thank John Moran Gonzalez publicly for his directorship in the preceding term, particularly in the last year or more now since CMAS, along with the other units that comprise Latino studies as well as all the other units across campus has had to become more creative in finding ways to continue serving our different communities. Thank you, John, as well as all the staff members that you work with for your steadfast vision and labor in making CMAS an important component of Chicanx and Latinx studies in the 21st century. I would be remiss to not give my thanks to the wonderful Latino studies staff for all of their behind the scenes work including the labor involved in bringing these town hall meetings to you, particularly Katie, Katie Buchanan, Ashley Nava, Alejandro Palacios, and Luis Guevara. And lastly, I should also thank all of you for joining us today. I know that you're probably wanting to put this last semester in the bag and have to decide between writing that one last paper or grading and, begin, and being here today. So I thank you for carving out some time to hear a bit about my work and my vision for CMAS, and of course, to engage in some conversation about the future directions of the center. So I'm, uh, for those of you that might not know me, some background experience um, that I have, and also to extend a bit of Carrie's generous introduction, I wanted to say a bit about myself and my work so that you may have a sense of how I'm arriving at this potential opportunity to serve as CMAS director. I arrived to the University of Texas at Austin in the fall of 2013. And since then, I have been involved with CMAS as an affiliate, which mostly involves some small committee work. But it wasn't until the last, in, it wasn't until the, two instances that I serve as interim chair of MAUS that I was able to work closer with CMAS and its directors, along with the director of the Latino Research Institute, as we began to think about ways of coming together with the intention of continuing to work towards the empowerment of students, scholars, and communities within and beyond UT, all while keeping in mind the primary tenets of ethnic studies and our collective mission. During my time as interim chair of MALS, I was able to work with, learn from, and made aware of how the tripartite structure of Latino studies works, particularly working with our shared staff, again, to ensure that the common set of concerns are addressed and the planned projects were successfully executed. CMAS, as most of you here today are perfectly aware of, is the legacy unit of Latino studies at UT and my desire to serve as director is to ensure that it continues to be a vital component in the furthering of Chicanx studies in the 21st century via public facing programming, but also in supporting faculty and student research, offering student engagement opportunities and enacting community outreach. If named director of CMAS, 
I will continue this work while also enhancing it with additional programs. Before continuing this presentation with some of these ideas for the future of CMAS, I want to briefly introduce myself via some of my scholarly work and research interests, as well as some programming I have been involved with since my arrival to Austin. As Carrie noted, I am quite resolute in and feel quite at home working in departments, programs, and centers that are defined by their interdisciplinarity. That is, in and with my affiliations, I stress my commitment to working across institutionalized knowledge formations that are usually based solely around a singular discipline, while also cutting through them and testing their limits. Thus, for example, in my own scholarly pursuits, I would say that my continual bringing together performance studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, and queer studies to think about Chicanx, Latinx, and Mexican performance and visual art has been a vital component of my intellectual sense of self, one that is nestled in an, in, in an intentionally promiscuous cross-disciplinary way of approximating culture and social phenomena, such as the monograph that I'm in the midst of writing that Carrie mentioned binding intimacies in contemporary queer Latinx performance and visual art. There I, take encount there, I take encounters and collaborative networks among artists as one of my framing devices to enhance the methodological approaches to art and culture, which I feel can be instructive in the ways that I can approach the leadership position of a unit whose heart is collaboration, public programming, and community engagement. This approach, I should also say, extends and nurtures my teaching at UT. To be sure, in order for me to, to be able to serve all those researchers that center Mexican American populations at UT, I am aware that I would need to work more diligently to establish relationships with those units that fall outside of my specific areas of research. This will ensure that these conversations happen across a wider spectrum of research interests and concerns. I'm hopeful that these will generate additional programming and faculty and graduate research support to ensure that CMAS serves students and faculty across the college and university. I believe that I can also bring to the CMAS director um, position some of my connections and involvement working with different cultural and art institutions in town, like Mexicarte, the Contemporary Austin, and this coming summer, the Museum of Human Achievement. Additionally, I have experience in Austin-based art curation and cultural programming, and have been involved in conjuring public programming there, which is something I can build upon to ensure the CIMAS continues the tradition of maintaining the existing bridges between UT and the Austin community at large. To highlight just one example, I currently serve on the board of directors of the Austin-based queer transmedia organization, Outsider, and I have been involved as part of the programming team and serve as its education coordinator. During the most recent annual festival, which happened virtually this past March, I curated a poetry crossover, an artist call and response across America, where I brought together six queer and gender non-conforming BIPOC poets from across the US to respond to racist agendas, anti-Blackness, incarceration, migrant detection, et cetera, through their poetic presentations. I am proud of this particular program as it was not only one of the most attended during the festival, but also done under great duress, the pandemic, anti-Blackness and anti-immigrant vitriol and let us not forget the storm that affected all of us here in Texas. But I would say that it was not only successful, I would say that it was not only successful, but it was also an infusion of much needed energy for those of us that witnessed it. With my sharing this today, I want to emphasize just one thing. I'm a strong believer in the programming of events that bring together people to talk about or simply sit with each other to listen and learn even if this is done virtually because of our present circumstances. These are great sources of energy, intellectual and emotional for us. And because of this, a position like CMAS director excites me.
Having said that, all of that, among my top priorities, especially for the first year as CMAS director, is to ensure that the program, programming that has already been planned, but um, some of which has been postponed because of the pandemic, continues forward and is done so successfully. Of highest importance among those events is the 50th anniversary commemorative Movidas conference. I would ensure it is executed in line with the vision when it was first discussed, but also with an understanding that perhaps now more than ever, the idea of coming together to think about what the past 50 years of Mexican American studies and more broadly Latinx studies and ethnic studies has meant for UT, the state of Texas is of vital and the state of Texas is of vital necessity. This coming together to reflect on the past and given the syst systemic oppression um, that continues to affect our communities, we will also need to gather around to think about any and all necessary future movidas. What are the movements that we must enact to ensure that the most vulnerable members of our communities are better off than they were before or they, they, they currently are? In addition to the Movidas Conference, I will ensure that all additional programming that was already slated for the 2021-2022 academic year is also carried out. And I understand that as the Movidas Conference, we'll need, to, um, we'll need good and clear communication between all Latino studies um, at UT leadership, including the current director and associate director, the staff, and the CMAS EC. Other programs that are of major importance for me revolve around faculty and graduate student research support. I'm eager to continue to work towards the success of CMAS's fellowship programs. Both the CMAS Benson Research uh, Fellowship and the Carlos Castañeda Postdoctoral uh, Fellowship. They have both been essential in the arenas of research for scholars outside of UT who have been able to be in residence for um, a summer or an academic year to take advantage of the Lilas Benson collection as well as the intellectual communities and the academic programming that Latino studies at UT and other adjacent units provide. I understand that the residency fellowships have been altered or halted due to the pandemic and will work towards a transition back to them or their restructuring to ensure that we are meeting the demands of research on the culture and social life of Latinx populations in the US while also complying with public health protocols. I am committed, for example, to continuing to nurture young scholars who are ex exiting doctoral programs with a PhD on hand and are doing some of the most groundbreaking research in our field, but are faced with a tough job market. Paying particular attention to the ways in which CMAS may be able to provide an opportunity to thrive in academia or outside of academia with a postdoctoral fellowship, for example, is something that I'm committed to continuing to do or starting up again. I will also ensure that the additional CMAS hallmark events and programs continue to thrive. In particular, the Americo Paredes Distinguished Lecture Series and the Sam, Sam Coronado Student Poster Art Scholarship Contest, which are corner stores in our community building. And I know that we all look forward to them every year as they activate our intellect and our creative brains. And they also serve as opportunities for the exchange of ideas and for new art for our walls and our swag. One of the ideas that I would, um, so this is sort of my goals um, in terms of implementing um, new projects. So one of the ideas that I would love to implement is the creation of research clusters or reading seminars. I know that we are all overworked and probably have a zillion things on our on our pile of books to read. But one of the things that I have always treasured as invaluable in the working on a research top topic or a series of common texts is coming together and discussing them with fellow um, minded folk. This um, felt even more urgent for me while in isolation during this last year, while I was exhausted as I'm sure you all were and still are, I crave intellectual connection. I would want to be mindful of what's possible in regard to everyone's time, but I'm interested in launching a pilot program to begin 
with by opening up a space uh, for faculty and grad students to come together to discuss and debate particular texts uh, or sets of texts that may that uh, may then lead to a formal research cluster. As an incentive, I will set aside money from the bu budget to ensure that people's time is compensated in some way. An, an additional idea that I have, and also um, because of CIMA's long-standing tradition of connecting thought and action, is to, uh, to foster participation between the different constituencies, students, faculty, and staff, and the communities beyond UT. I'm interested in an artist and activist residency program that um, I know um, an initial conversation has already begun with uh, the current director. I would want to continue um, with, with, um, with this, with this uh, possibility. Um, sorry, I lost my I lost my place. Let me just um, backtrack a little bit. I'm aware of initial conversations about a residency program such as this to be able to have cultural makers and political activists in residency in residence and inside the walls of the Gordon White Building. It would enrich the ethnic studies education and experience of our students first and foremost, as well as others that may be interested in, uh, through public presentation and workshops. Being able to create structural programming that would benefit our students, both undergraduate and graduate, is of vital importance to me as CMAS emerged from student struggle more than 50 years ago. Moreover, given both the intellectual and spatial proximity, it would be of utmost importance for me as well as a goal to expand the structural linkages between Black studies and Latino studies with joint programming which will generate conversations and new knowledges. One of the ways in which I see us uh, coming together is through undergrad undergraduate engagement. I would love to create the necessary scenario to bring together a number of undergraduates to structure conversations between the two units. These conversations that would um, work as brainstorming opportunities would put into motion a type of public event in the spirit, again, of student-led efforts at UT. If CMAS was uh, created by UT students out of a need to address the most pressing curriculum and community issues affecting uh, Mexican American people more than 50 years ago, the students themselves should come together and work alongside the staff and the faculty in determining what should be produced to best serve them and their needs intellectually, socially, and culturally. Additional ways in which Black studies and Latinx studies may work together would be to uh, would be um, to be able to co-curate visual art shows in the different gallery spaces in the Gordon White Building and other cultural and artistic presentations. One easy way to do this would be uh, to bring a short-term residency, residency visit, I'm sorry, one easy way to uh, do this would be to uh, start a short-term residency visiting artists and or media slash image maker to campus who may work with students um, in Latino studies, in Black studies, but also in our um, adjacent uh, um, programs and units like uh, NACE and Asian American studies and um, others to create workshops that will enable students to produce new work, which they could ultimately present um, like in, on a, in a yearly basis, perhaps. This could be run first, again, also as a pilot program, but it's successful. And if there's interest, um, as well as resources to carry this forward, it may become an institutionalized program. With this in mind, and given my relationship with the incoming Dean of uh, COPA, um, as well as our overlapping, uh, this is uh, Dean Ramon Rivera Cervera, as well as our other, um, as our overlapping areas of research, I'm envisioning being able to work with him and across colleges to think about the arts in relationship to questions of race and ethnicity as key in making social life more bearable for those having to endure systems of oppression, not just race, that are relentless at this historical juncture. Lastly, I'm perfectly aware that these new projects would necessitate funds to ensure that they happen. 
Thus, I will continue any efforts that are already in place for fundraising and continue to identify potential donors for these programs. In that uh, vein of thought, I will work with uh, Latino Studies staff, the Latino Studies ambassadors, as well as the COLA, as well as COLA's development office in identifying potential donors that will be interested in contributing towards student center efforts, as well as uh, other uh, possible fundraising ventures. In conclusion, I believe that we must be mindful of all the different players and the myriad of possibilities that make up our field. If ethnic studies is, and I have no doubt this to be the case, the most important is the most important constellation of fields in academia in the 21st century. I will work towards this vision and these goals and the EC will play an important role in advising and approving this and any changes that may come in the future years. So um, just, you know, I think I'm within the time limit of, of 20 minutes to ensure that there's a ample um, opportunities for, for conversation and discussion. I will happy, I'm happy to now take um, your questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, uh, thank you for that wonderful discussion, and I'm here to help you moderate any questions that might be coming your way. Um, awesome. And somebody's going to start us off with, how can you expand community engagement? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that, um, of course, again, community engagement, um, you know, there's sort of been um, a, 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 historically sort of at, at the heart of, of, uh, of CMOS, right? Um, I will work towards identifying who are some of the community leaders, you know, in Austin. Um, I know that uh, there, might be, there might be the sort of uh, work towards bringing them back to the you know, sort of the CMOS community is, is of vital importance. So I would work with uh, the staff as well as the leadership to identify who some of these leaders uh, in the community are, bringing them together and um, sort of hear what their concerns are and how the you know, CMOS and UT uh, as a whole can help nurture what are, you know, and address some of these concerns that they might have, right? So I will start off by having a series of, of conversations with, uh, with uh, some of the leaders in our community, in the Austin community, and then, you know, sort of begin to sort of uh, prioritize what some of their concerns might be, and then continue to, to sort of create programming uh, or uh, certain types of events, or, you know, I would also want, you know, to, offer the possibility of doing more um, work that takes, you know, the faculty and the students outside of sort of the 40 acres into Austin, because I know there's sort of a need to also sort of be visible out there um, in the community, right? So what are some of the ways in which, you know, we can also um, not just bring the community to UT, but how can we also uh, work towards, um, you know, getting out there, you know, because we need to also ensure that uh, what we mean by community engagement is that uh, it, it's, it's both ways, right? Um, so again, a series of conversations with some of the leaders, identifying the concerns and finding ways to bring, you know, that community into UT, but also the other way out, right? Uh, which I, you know, I would probably stress the second S being of a, of, of, uh, of, uh, higher priority, right? To get ourselves out there. How can we uh, get our students to be involved in some of these efforts out there? And, you know, how can SEMA support those efforts? So, um, and I think you were sort of responding to this, what are the type of leaders that you need to identify, which is the follow-up question. I'm not, do you feel like that's been answered or would you like to respond to that a little more because we have a thick question for you following that? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that question. Uh, hold on. <laughs> uh, the type of leaders, I mean, I, that's actually a great question. 
I, you know, I do want to ensure that, uh, that it is, you know, leaders that are working in the trenches um, of, again, some of the most vital issues affecting our communities. So, you know, uh, of course, you know, some of the things that, that come to mind uh, revolve around um, our, you know, sort of leaders that are actively you know, working towards, you know, sort of, uh, um, the closing of detention centers, for example, right? Who are some of these leaders, right? Let's talk to them. Let's 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 talk about how we can uh, serve them, right? So it 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 is about sort of creating a a list of some of the concerns and then identifying some of these leaders, right? So while I might have you know connections with the arts and cultures community, I'm not saying that that's all the sort of the leadership that uh, that I would be talking to. I'm also interested in some of the most uh, um, pressing issues revolving uh, migration, incarceration, and so forth, right? Um, so I I don't have a exact answer, like you know I don't have names for you, but uh, those types of leaders I'm interested in, in talking to. All right, excellent. Um, thank you, Lara. The next question we have is from uh, a graduate student that I believe we both know, Elena Perez de Tun. Mm -hmm. uh, her question is, Latino studies at UT is a cluster of CMOS, malls, and the LRI. And as you mentioned, the job market can seem incredibly bleak in addition to concerns posed by underpaid at UT. So how do you envision collaborating with and supporting specifically malls graduate students? Thank you, Elena, for that question. Um, yes, this is one of the things I briefly mentioned and I, you know, um, pondered if it was, you know, uh, how I would expand that um, aspect of it. I, you know, would want to, you know, without, without sort of, uh, sort of stepping in the sort of the toes of, of malls, but of course, since we are, you know, sort of a, a, an umbrella or part of the sort of same umbrella um, group, I would work, you know, with um, malls and also the, the LRI to ensure that the malls grad students, um, first and foremost, but also all of the other grad students that are part of the portfolio program, as well as, you know, other students that, uh, you know, would be interested um, in um, participating in an effort that we might, you know, sort of think about putting together, which is, you know, um, you know, often we think about ways of professionalizing of sort of professional development of those students, right? How, you know, we can create workshops around, you know, uh, working on, you know, cover letters, you know, uh, mock job talks and so forth, right? Those are the things that we can easily do and have been done in the past. And I would, you know, um, you know, CMOS would for sure, you know, want to be part of that. Um, but some other, other ways in, you know, in relationship to um, Elena's question about the bleak market, I would, you know, want to also perhaps, you know, create a series of, um, you know, additional kind of workshops that revolved around, you know, the job market that is within academia and beyond academia, right? So again, this would create, this would sort of necessitate identifying who are some of these um, speakers that could come and do workshops with the students to help, you know, sort of uh, them in perhaps sort of thinking about jobs outside of academia, right? Sort of what are sort of alternative academic um, ways in which one could use their, their doctoral degrees, right? Um, I do think that, you know, you know, one possible example, you know, that I can, you know, think of is not just sort of, you know, not only sort of migrant, migrant advocacy, for example, type of jobs that are there, you know, for us uh, to use our expertise and our knowledge, uh, or, you know, uh, museum curation and things like that, right? There are ways in which, you know, our knowledge can be uh, used outside of uh, academic circles. So, you know, perhaps creating a series of workshops with people that have successfully done this type of work to come and, and, and work with, with students who are, are seeking alternative, um, you know, academic routes uh, if, you know, an academic uh, job is not entirely possible. 
Um, I hope that answers your question, Elena, and, and, and I'm here to support all, any of that. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I, I think we're good to move on to the next question. We're getting some wonderful questions, uh, including from uh, esteemed community leader, Paul Saldana. Uh, his question is an article posted this morning by NBC Latino reports that the University of Texas has enrolled enough Latinos to be considered a Hispanic serving institution, a milestone both cheered and dismissed not dismissed by me, <laughs> but UT Austin <laughs> turns 128 years old this year. The year Hispanics in Texas are projected to outnumber whites to become Texas's largest population group. As the potential new director of CMOS, what specifically will you do to ensure we close the gap at UT to ensure we have population proportionate Latino student enrollment at UT? This is a great question. Uh, thank you, Paul, uh, Paul, for that. Um, I am excited to hear this news. I, again, I also cheer as as, as Carrie. Um, it's not easily dismissed, and I, you know, am very very committed as as uh, someone that you know who teaches primarily um, Latinx students. You know, and most of them are from Texas. I, you know, would uh, do anything to support any recruitment efforts to continue to bring students to to our campus, um, and also to ensuring that you know that they they are successful, that they thrive, right? Because one of the you know um, things that most worries me is actually you know the attrition rates, right? The 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 students that don't actually um, end up um, graduating right this was felt very very uh, strong um strongly this last year right um where you know our students are having to manage so much that the you know um somehow you know their schooling and um their matriculation at ut had to be deprioritized um for different reasons whether it's the pandemic or you know the storm really affected some of my students, I was very difficult. I was very sort of um, sad to see that some of them you know um, end up you know withdrawing from my classes, and I assume also from UT. So how can we um, you know now that we have the numbers you know to be in HSI, how can we actually you know put our resources there to recruit? And then also to maintain those students that they're successful. I think you know once again, um, student engagement programs um, will be really attractive for those uh, incoming students as possibilities to um, to get involved in. And then also you know while they're here, you know to sort of keep them and and give them a sense of community. From just um, my you know few years since you know we've been at. The Gordon White Building, and because of our largely uh, due to the efforts of, of the staff that you know puts into motion some some of these visions that the leadership has, we we know that our students um, thrive in community and they come to us and are there in you know in the different bienvenidas and so forth because uh, we mean something to them, right? So how can we use our our uh, resources to continue to do that work, right? Because they then, you know, um, effectuate, um, you know, um, uh, uh, some sort of a feeling that, you know, they, they can actually do it, you know? That, that would be one way, recruitment and retention of students. All right, well, we're gonna bounce a little between the Q&A and the chat. And I saw that um, Martha Cotera, another community leader, mm -hmm. um, has uh, thrown a, a, a question for you. She's commented, wonderful aspirational goals, which are also community oriented. Uh, Laurel, I, possibly Mallory Laurel and I were planning transportation for students to community events, both for student involvement and because participating in community institutions prepares them for community building after graduation in the communities where they will reside, lifelong learning and advocacy. Would you support such efforts? Oh, uh, thank you, Martha. Um, great to hear you. Uh, your question via via text here, via chat. 
I actually did not know, was not aware of this um, thing, but that's actually a brilliant idea. So my enthusiasm for this brilliant idea that uh, you had been discussing with Mallory, I will completely uh, uh, support um, with, with any resources. Because again, as I was saying, you know, I really do think that what, you know, there is, there is a, a sort of barrier and mobility, you know, sort of, you know, within Austin and across different, you know, and through different sectors of town is um, hinders student um, possibility of being in the community. So transportation would be key. So thank you for that. I was not aware, but now I am and I'm excited about that possibility. So I would definitely continue to move forward with that if um, appointed director. All right, and we now have an interesting question from the Q&A, which is, how would you connect CMOS with Chicano, Mexican-American, Latino, Latina studies programs in Texas and note specific initiatives, please? Um, that's, that's great. I mean, that's a great question. I, um, you know, I mean, this is one of the things, right, the, that has at, at sort of at, at the level of, of higher education, it has um, been difficult um, because of sort of faculty involvement in sort of thinking about possible ways in which um, our shared interest, you know, um, among you know, colleagues in the UT system, for example, um, there's been moments in which, you know, we started, you know, uh, back when um, Richard Flores was interim chair, I know that, you know, we came together to begin to sort of hatch out uh, perhaps um, an initiative that would bring together people that are interested in, in sort of border studies, right? And I know we had several of those um, meetings um, and then you know people just got busy or things just happened that they sort of fall to the wayside right so I think that there is um, a way in which we can um, bring those uh, types of connections back because the connections are, are there we know who our colleagues are and we know that you know um, everyone is, is is sort of strapped for time and, and overburdened with 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 responsibilities right um, but you know I would work with uh, with uh, the rest of the Latino studies leadership to you know see if we can possibly begin to work with our colleagues um, in these different uh, locations in the UT system you know sometimes it's it's a, it's a little bit more difficult with uh, Texas A&M because of the competition and so forth right so that's that's one uh, possible uh, way um, to sort of bring those things back activate them. Um, and then, of course, this doesn't get at, um, you know, the other um, sort of education um, programs, you know, that are not part of, of, of the higher education system, which, you know, has to do with high schools and so forth, right? Um, I know that when, you know, within Austin, when we were, when I was, you know, interim chair of MAUS, we had, um, you know, um, visits, we had, you know, sort of structured visits from different um, high schools and middle schools that would come to um, and through uh, uh, malls specifically, right, but CMAS could also be uh, involved and engaged in, in doing some sort of uh, programming, you know, which leads to my previous answer about um, student recruitment and, and, and retention, right? Uh, how can we also um, let those students in particularly you know at the high school level know not only that UT is there for them I mean they know that UT exists but to think of the of UT as a possibility uh, and to strive to you know uh, enter as a student um, is also difficult because uh, they might feel you know intimidated or not smart enough and so forth right so how can we nurture those connections with uh, with uh, with the you know specifically at the high school level to ensure that uh, the students that think about UT as a possibility actually you know uh, apply and then enroll in UT. Um, yeah, I think I got lost along the way with my answer, but that those are some of the things that I can think of uh, at the moment. 
Well, I think everyone can appreciate your ambition. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Lara. Um, mm -hmm. We have another question for you. Um, uh, you make community engagement and coalitional student programming uh, sound easy, which I love. <laughs> what do you think gets in the way of that kind of community building from happening more organically on campus? We use the acronym QT BIPOC all the time to recognize separate groups. But how do we organize coalitions for trans and queer, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian students, staff, and faculty, especially with academic programs that are so siloed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Because, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's possible. Right, I, I feel it's possible. I, I've just sort of seen um, sort of my way of answering is sort of some of the things that I've experienced, right? So I, I talked about um, my you know, sort of programming through Outsider Fest as a possibility of a model for precisely that kind of thing, right? The ways in which um, the different um, you know, sort of the different subgroups are actually, you know, they have separate and specific needs and concerns, but overall, like there's more in common than there is in terms of difference, right? And I see that um, with my students, particularly my undergraduate students, right? What are some of the concerns that they bring to the table? What, you know, even if we're talking about pop culture and I never want to dismiss pop culture because I teach it, right? I teach about it uh, to these students, right? But, you know, what is it about pop culture that, you know, that can actually sort of help mediate social relationships, right? And what are the ways in which the students and their own subject position, how can they push back and, you know, um, a, do a, a critique of, the, the sort of the limits of, you know, sort of mass produced culture, right? So then this creates um, opportunities for them to write research papers, do creative projects that are actually sort of thinking across the different, um, the different, you know, subgroups that we often, you know, are, are siloed. That the, I, I didn't really answer the question, but I actually am hopeful that I, that I can do this kind of, of, uh, of programming, uh, um, student programs specifically, um, because of what I've seen is possible, right? And what I've also you know, been able to do, right? Um, you know, and also because these are also similar interests, you know, I'm very committed to, um, to the, you know, to these, to this different parts of this acronym that was uh, spelled out um, in, the, in the question. All right, so we still, we have um, gotten wonderful questions, Laura. So um, we have a, a couple, I think there's like two to three here, and then we're gonna have to wrap up for the sake of time. Um, but I would like to try to get these questions in uh, for your response. So um, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Schroeder Arce has written, thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, you mentioned ethnic studies in relation to higher education. Of course, there are huge considerations and needs in K through 12 education. How do you see the role of the CMOS director, if any, as an advocate and leader in public school policy? Thank you, Roxanne, for, for, for your question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this, this goes you know, in, in hand with, uh, with some of the things that I was saying in terms of what CMOS could do um, in terms of uh, um, working with, with students um, in high school, right? But in terms of policy, this, you know, I, I know that we have, um, you know, amazing affiliates, you know, that are part of CMAS that are in the, you know, School of Education that work tirelessly to actually, you know, advocate for um, students, you know, uh, Mexican American students, you know, in the K through 12 level, right? So how can, you know, how can I serve them? I mean, they have, they have the know-how, they have the possibility, right? So um, I, you know, I'm limited in terms of what I can do, but I can definitely support the, you know, the 
the ideas and the and the projects that our colleagues, you know, um, in the School of Education have to be able to, you know, to effectuate, you know, these policies to to better um, our students at that level, right? All right, and because the um, the next question in our Q and A is, feels uh, related, we'll go with that, and then we'll turn to the question that's also in the chat. So this question is: What would you specifically do to promote ethnic studies in public schools of Texas? Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's a great question. I um, yeah, no, I mean, you know, again, I think that um, that. Um, you know, we have, again, it's connected to, to the previous answer, right? We have um, great colleagues who are working, you know, sort of steadfastly at, at these, at, at getting at, 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 these, at these answers in very um, concrete ways, right? But how can, you know, sort of SEMA serve um, those projects and those possibilities, right? I, you know, I would want to, um, again, this, this is connected to a, a, a series of, and this is just an idea that I'm, I'm sort of hatching out at this moment. So, you know, I apologize for it not being completely thought out, but, you know, I'm just kind of like thinking about, you know, the previous question about ensuring that our students are also engaged in, you know, um, this type of, 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 um, of um, sort of community um, programs, right? Uh, how can we, you know, sort of as faculty and more than anything, grad students and undergraduate students, how can we, you know, um, work with them to give them training possibilities um, within ethnic studies in a pedagogical level, right? So can we create a program to, you know, sort of advocate for ethnic studies or bring ethnic studies to, um, you know, K through 12 level um, in different, you know, schools, you know, in Austin and beyond, right? In Central Texas, or maybe even the whole of the state of Texas, right? Um, by creating sort of programmings or, or sort of events where our students are our best um, advocates and might, you know, sort of go, you know, do class visits or, you know, school visits, you know, to, to, to sort of, talk about the importance of ethnic studies, right? Because I think, I really do think, um, I do believe what I said earlier, right? I think, you know, ethnic studies is at the forefront of so many of the um, ways in which um, academia needs to move towards, right? Um, and I, you know, as, as, as someone that's very committed and, and believes that, um, I would want to ensure that uh, this is not something that's sort of preserved or, um, you know, higher education. We should all, we should not all have um, uh, all of the good things, right? Uh, I think they need to be distributed, you know, uh, and I do believe that uh, our students, you know, would be open to this because of, of who they are, you know, sort of just the, you know, demographics of, of, of Texas students, you know, just, just you know, sort of speaks volumes, right? Um, but them not knowing until they enter college, if they ever enter college, that ethnic studies is a way of rethinking um, the way that this country has, you know, sort of treated them is of huge importance, um, just on a personal level, not to mention, you know, the possibilities of using that knowledge to create, you know, art, to create policy, to create, you know, the changes that we need in, in this country. Oh, I sounded like a president. Sorry, that's not. <laughs> but that's that's. I do believe that. I do believe in in ethnic studies. Thank you, thank you, Lara. Um, mm -hmm. We have uh, one last question for you, and then we will close out our time. And we're we're at our like uh, five minutes to the end of the hour, so we'll try to keep this uh, short and sweet. But at the same time, this is a kind of hefty question: What is the role of CMOS and the CMOS director? in ensuring that the issues identified in the Hispanic equity report are resolved. Don't those inequities undermine the university's aspiration of being an HSI? Wow, yeah, that is, that is a hefty question. 
And I am not necessarily sure I, I have the, the answer, right? Or the best answer even. Um, just because this, uh, again, um, is you know, a complicated issue. It, you know, it is the university uh, wanting to pat itself on the back for, you know, um, being HS, HSI and wanting to sort of jump on that bandwagon at the same time that we know that there's um, structural inequalities that affect, you know, many of us who are probably on this call, right? Um, you know, women of color, you know, particularly, you know, Latinas um, and, you know, other women of color and other, you know, um, minorities, if we want to use that term, right? Are, you know, overworked and underpaid. You know, we know that to be, uh, you know, a fact, right? So how, you know, how can we, you know, actually, you know, continue to push, you know, as, as a collective, how can we continue to push, you know, um, you know, the different deans and the different sort of uh, higher uh, administrators of this university to, you know, sort of see that there's an inconsistency between these two and that they need to, um, you know, not just, you know, sort of um, jump on, you know, sort of that cloud of like they arrive somewhere by arriving at, you know, the status of an HSI, but, you know, you also need to ensure that uh, the people that are doing the work, you know, carrying the heft of that labor to, you know, recruit, retain, you know, um, program um, around student, you know, um, engagement efforts. Um, uh, you know, how, how can, how can th th those are the same people that are overworked and underpaid, you know? So you, they need to be aware of that um, inconsistency within that, right? So I wouldn't have the answer but I will work with uh, with leadership, you know, not just within Latino studies, but uh, the other um, people that drafted that uh, report, as well as anyone else that would want to be involved at you know at this new juncture, to ensure that uh, that our voices are heard. Uh, so we need to just you know clamor hard, clamor hard and strong, um, and point to that inconsistency. Thank you for that question. That's that's that, that is a that is a heavy question. But, uh, it's a, but it's I, a, I think we could do it collectively. You know, uh, I'm ready to scream. <laughs> okay, collectively is always a good way to, <laughs> to bring our conversation to an end. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Lara Gutierrez, for joining us today, for presenting, for presenting your vision for the center. We're uh, so grateful. Um, Everyone who has registered for this talk should receive via email a request for feedback. So please be alert um, to that uh, request. We also hope that you will join us tomorrow for a different talk from Dr. Maggie Rivas Rodriguez. And um, I, as, as mentioned at the start, we these are stellar faculty and colleagues that we have to present to you. And we know um, they would uh, do an amazing job, but we would really appreciate the direction that you would like to see for the center. So with that, we're going to uh, close our event today. Thank you all so much, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you all for your questions. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. Yes. Thank you, Carrie and Ashley and everyone else.